Welcome to Lantern TV's special election show, Race to the Presidency. I'm your host, Ariana Bernard. It has been a long and unique campaign season, and it will all wrap up in just a few days as America decides who the next President of the United States will be. Will it be the Democratic ticket featuring former Secretary of State and Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton running with Virginia Senator Tim Kaine? Or will it be American businessman and the Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump running with Indiana Governor Mike Pence? We are aware there are many issues to be covered from this campaign season and many opinions to be heard. For the purpose of this show, you will hear from several experts and individuals within the university in hopes that insights into the major party presidential candidates, their platforms, the issues most relevant to millennials, and much more will be gained. We will begin by hearing from Academy Professor of Political Science from Ohio State, Paul Beck, on the differences between Clinton and Trump's platforms. The issue differences between the candidates, I think, are very clear. Uh, they are different in terms of tax policy, with Trump really cha having changed his tax policy. The early proposals were to lower taxes across the board, but less so for wealthy Americans. He now has kind of adopted the Republican stance from Congress, and that is to try to lower taxes on people who are well off. Whereas Clinton has talked about taxing the wealthy uh, and adding a surtax to their tax bill uh, and closing some loopholes to make sure that indeed they are, are paying their taxes. They started out somewhat different on free trade, which is of course a big issue here in Ohio, particularly northeastern Ohio. Clinton, by opposing the TPP, the, the uh, Trans-Pacific Pact, uh, has narrowed those differences. But the truth is, I think Clinton is more favorable to free trade with other countries, certainly than, than, than Trump is. The interesting thing about that is that the Republican leadership in Congress are free traders. They don't like the Trump policy. Another area of big differences has to do with foreign policy. I mean, it looks like Trump is very much an isolationist. He doesn't want us to spend money abroad. He wants our allies to pony up to provide support and, and to increase their military expenditures. Uh, Clinton really likes those alliances and I think wants to support them over time. That's another big difference between Trump and the Republican establishment. While these issues are important to many and most Americans, a recent study conducted by Bank of America and USA Today sampling 2,180 18 to 26 year olds across the country found that for 68% of those surveyed in Ohio, the economy was more important than social issues. 80% said their personal financial situation would factor how they vote. The study also found the top three most important issues for millennials in this election are job growth, taxes, and national economy. 55% of students with debt say yes, it will impact their voting decision or it will a lot, while 45% say it will not influence their voting decision. Professor Beck addressed some of these concerns when speaking about issues most prominent among millennials. And I think a lot of students, particularly in the last decade, have faced a job market that was very hard to enter and to enter at the kinds of jobs that they were prepared for and aspired to. Uh, and that continues to be a problem here and abroad. I mean, it's a problem in Europe as well, but it's certainly a problem here. And so they're concerned about that. They're concerned about the economy. More, I think, on the part of college students about the white collar economy, not so much blue collar industrial jobs. Uh, those are not the jobs they aspire to. Clinton addressed issues about the economy and job market when she spoke to the campus community during her visit to Ohio State on October 10th. We got to make up our minds about what kind of economy we want, and I'm pretty clear about that. I think we want new jobs with rising incomes. Well, right now, the Chinese have twice as much renewable energy as we do. So maybe they think it's a hoax, but they're investing, and they're creating, and they're going to want to export. And what a shame it would be. We have innovated. We have made the technology that could bring us into the forefront of this, and we're going to do it. During a visit to Delaware, Ohio on October 20th, Trump told a group of supporters, quote, My plan for the economy can be summed up by three words, jobs, jobs, jobs. He told supporters, quote, your company won't be leaving Ohio under a Trump economy. 
Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., visited the Ohio Union on campus on November 1st and also touched on jobs within the United States. We want to see those jobs come back to this country. We want to take that American dream back from someone in a far-off land and have it in our own backyards. And we know that you guys are going to do it. Another large issue many college students face is student debt. Recent statistics state there is a total U.S. student loan debt of $1.26 trillion. There are 44.2 million Americans with student loan debt and a student loan delinquency rate of 11.1%. The average monthly student loan payment for borrowers aged 20 to 30 years old is $351 per month. Some students here on campus have voiced rising college costs as a concern high on their list. I think in the future, we need somebody that's really going to focus on the issues that um, we're dealing with in this country, health care, um, economic growth, um, uh, security, you know. So I think that I want to see them focus more on the issues instead of veering away from the issues um, in order to make the other candidate less appealing. One of the issues that's particularly important to me is uh, making sure that people have equitable access to education. Clinton throughout her campaign has addressed her plan to reduce college debt and tuition and restated this during her Ohio State visit. And it isn't for a lot of people now. And a lot of states have disinvested in their great public colleges and universities. So here is our proposal. We want anyone from a family that makes less than $125,000 a year to go to Ohio State University tuition free. Hillary Clinton, just the fact that uh, she's got this plan to refinance your loans to bring the interest rates down. Uh, to make college debt-free uh, if your parents earn under a certain annual wage. The fact that she's sort of experienced and she's sort of uh, seen how women are treated in, in institutions like uh, in the workplace as well as, you know, sort of collegiately. And I think that just that experience as a woman in America is enough to sort of be more empathetic and more uh, effective towards changing culture on campus. And whether it's a workable plan or not, we'll see. It will require congressional cooperation, and more importantly, since she's talking about state universities and colleges, it will require cooperation by the states. Whether that's going to be forthcoming, I, I think, is, is questionable. But she at least recognizes the problem and wants to try to remedy it in one way or another. Trump also addressed the issue of student debt during his visit to Columbus on October 13th, where he spoke to a group of around 450 millennials. Trump introduced his plan for an income-based repayment program for student debt that he said will cap at 12.5 percent interest. He said, quote, students should not be asked to pay more of their loans than they can afford, and it should not be an albatross that is around for the rest of their lives. He said, quote, I will make sure students have the information they need for repaying student loans so you can do it and you can do it very easily. Aside from talk on policies, popular topics of discussion from the media and the public have been about controversies from both Trump and Clinton throughout their campaigns. The first we will dive into is the concerns some have about Trump's style and the use of his language. It's a very uh, belligerent style in many ways. It manifests itself in treatment of women, and you saw this both in the debate but in terms of the accusations that have been made against him. What strikes me is that, that those accusations fit him very well if you go even beyond women. He's somebody who likes to attack particular groups in the population, particular individuals, anybody who criticizes him. That's been a problem for him as a candidate, and it's led many Republicans to back away from him as a candidate. Some of Trump's language and behavior, especially his comments made regarding women, have given Clinton's campaign some ammunition to work with. President Barack Obama visited the Columbus area on November 2nd, and one of the main questions asked of the audience was whether Trump was a president people would want to their children to look up to. It's about doing what's right even when it costs you votes. That's one of the reasons I'm so proud of Michelle right now. She doesn't love politics. It wasn't her first choice for our family. But she's been working her heart out for Hillary, and it's because not only does she believe in Hillary, but she also knows our kids are watching this election. And when she sees the way Trump behaves, she knows that should not be an example we set for our kids. She knows there's something fundamental at stake 
that, that, that goes beyond plans or policies. And that's the character of our country. However, even though some of the controversial comments made by Trump may have been seen as negative by media outlets and the public, his supporters are able to see past it. He's such a raw, outgoing person. You know, everyone makes mistakes. And I think when the locker room talk came out, um, you can't mean to tell me that half of the male population hasn't already said those things. It does not bother me whatsoever. It was a private conversation. A lot of these things that are coming out about him, it is a private conversation. You know, a lot of things I say private aren't helpful to, you know, whatever I'm trying to better myself at. So I've just stuck with him because it's not about what you say in private. It's about what you're going to do to help me and the rest of the... Um, the um, United States. One bad, funny, kind of awkward, inappropriate thing came out about him saying something 11 years ago. I think I'm not ignoring it. I know he said it, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of disappointed that he did say it and that it was found out. But at the same time, he's apologized for it. I think he's a changed man, and I think he wants to truly still commit to this country like you know he said all along. He said the same thing for 30 years, since the 80s, when he was hinting at running for president. Throughout his campaign, Trump has also addressed his concerns with America's current immigration policy. And while doing so, some individuals have become upset by his rhetoric. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. It's not so much his comments as it is the cheers you hear in the back when, you know, he says we are going to temporarily ban Muslims from entering the country. Like, you just hear the crowd go wild and you're like, oh, like there are actually like people in this country that don't think I should be allowed in here. I was born here. I was raised here. I'm proud to be an American. Like, that's crazy to me. So me personally, like, obviously I'm offended. I'm a little bit worried, um, more so than the candidate itself himself, it's the, the supporters that really scare me because they think it's okay to say racial slurs to me and not just me, but like any other minority. You hear him speak um, ill of Latinos and African Americans, women, you know, it's just everything that, that could ever be a problem in the, Amer like the United States, he's spoken negatively against. Trump has been known for his plan to build a wall along the Mexican border in order to keep out illegal immigrants. He has made comments against various minority groups, including Latinos, saying in June 2015 that, quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good. We're going to have strong, incredible borders, and people are going to come into our country, but they're going to come into our country legally. They're going to come in legally. We're going to build a wall. It's going to be built. We heard from Ohio State Latino Student Association President Sebastian Bologna and actress America Ferreira, who are Hillary supporters, to learn why they support that candidate. I always want to see it as Trump is wanting to build uh, walls, but uh, Hillary wants to build bridges between uh, different cultures and uh, the world. Also, being able to care for our community and our culture. There is so much at stake for all of us in this election, no matter what your background is. But for the Latino community in particular, we have so much at stake. In terms of why I'm out here for Hillary, why I have been campaigning for Hillary for years and years, is she's always stood with our community. She's always stood with the issues that matter to us, access to education, access to health care, comprehensive immigration reform. She was a, a sponsor of of a comprehensive immigration reform when she was in the Senate and she voted for it and she stood with our community. And, and now it's about standing with her, but it's also just about standing for ourselves. Although Trump's immigration policy is not well received amongst all voters, Trump supporters did find some positive meaning behind it. Even if we don't build a physical wall, because I'm definitely not about shutting people out, I think that it should still stand as a metaphor that the immigration system in the U.S. needs to be reformed. Because I don't think there's any problem at all, and I've talked to certain you know, like liberals too that agree with me, that there's not really much of a problem with having a better system. Because right now our system is extremely messed up where it's hard for people to get in the country legally. So you have people that can come in here legally and they do what they do, but a lot of times they're given, in, they're given resources or um, other government benefits that the working class does not receive. So sometimes these illegal immigrants don't have the same incentive to become citizens in the U.S. 
Switching from the Republican Party, Clinton has also received negative media coverage after it was discovered she was sending emails from a private account and later deleted and bleached those emails, leading to a federal investigation. On July 5, 2016, it was announced that the FBI's investigation had concluded that Clinton was extremely careless in handling her email system, but recommended that no charges be filed against her. On July 2016, Attorney General Loretta Lynch announced that no charges would be filed. However, just recently, on October 28, 2016, Congress was notified that the FBI has started looking into newly discovered emails that may be pertinent to the case. Clinton's email scandals have plagued her campaign since nearly the beginning and have caused some citizens to consequently not trust her. I think she's absolutely horrible. Um, I think she's a liar. She's a fraud. Um, I think it's absolutely despicable that Obama, President Obama, is um, campaigning for her right now when his administration, the government, is prosecuting her. And she's under federal investigation. I mean, we can't let somebody in the White House that's you know, constantly under scrutiny and under FBI investigations and things like that. Once I started looking into the email scandal more, I just realized that you know, Hillary Clinton has said that she doesn't have anything to hide, but if you, you know, have a private server and you delete as many emails as you did, and then you ended up bleaching all those things, which is an expensive process, you have to be hiding something. The candidates' platforms, as well as addressing the controversies they have been involved in, were hot topics during the three presidential debates. But what impacts do debates really have? The debates have been important but they've been more reinforcing of impressions people already had of these candidates. On the positive side for Clinton, reinforcing the fact that she's competent and capable and knows a lot about policy uh, and is very cool under pressure. You know, on the negative side for Trump, that he can't control himself, uh, which I think is scary to a lot of voters, even people already inclined to, to support him, perhaps. Nathaniel Swigger, associate professor of political science at Ohio State, also touched on how the debates affect voter opinion. Uh, they're not persuasion events. These are activation events. Uh, nobody watches a debate and has their mind changed about free trade or immigration or anything like that. Um, it's a chance for a candidate to come out, give a strong performance, look presidential, and then people who are predisposed to like that candidate become more enthusiastic uh, and more likely to vote and you know volunteer and things like that. At least for me, it and not only um, it reaffirmed what I already believed about each candidate, but it also um, gave me confidence in who I'm going to vote for. But what are the range of participants in this year's election? Um, I think there's a definite range of students. There are some students who are very involved in learning about politics and um, very educated about both parties and both candidates. Um, and there are many students who are not educated and trying to get more educated by coming to the rallies or watching the debates or doing their research. And then there are those students who don't care so much about the politics and think it won't affect them as much. Um, and those are the students, I think, that uh, should really be encouraged to learn more about the politics because um, what the outcome of the election will really affect them in the long run. For many college students, 2016 is their first presidential election, and according to Swigger, a person's first presidential election can have a lasting impact on their political engagement. The first election matters a lot, because it's basically setting a pattern of whether or not you're going to engage in politics and how you're going to do it. So what do you do <laughs> if you're a young person in this election? Um, where? You don't particularly like the direction of the country. Uh, maybe you don't particularly like Hillary Clinton. You really don't like Donald Trump. You really don't feel like you're a Republican. And so you become much more likely to be disengaged from politics because you genuinely believe that there's no one to represent you. Uh, and that's a really, really dangerous precedent to set, I think, because it would be very, very easy, especially early in life, to just not vote. Uh, and that makes you significantly less likely to vote later. Some millennials recognize the importance of voting and are ready to make their voices heard. We're shattering barriers, and I think being a college aid student at this period, you know, maybe I was a little too young to see to really realize the impact of electing Obama, but I'm going to be right in the middle of it uh, if Hillary Clinton's elected. Kind of exciting. It's weird to think about how, I guess, on a on a larger scale, a single vote uh, isn't the most impactful, but it, for me, voting is uh, like to have a say at all is really a big change, I guess, in my life. Um, there's just such a huge number of college students and they're spread out in every location throughout the country. Um, so 
in order to get them elected. Um, the college students' votes are very important, but also just um, the college students are the generation that will be most affected by the candidates. Um, you know, uh, middle-aged people and um, elderly people have seen their fair share of politics and presidents, um, but it's our generation that will be the next to be elected in office in the next uh, few decades. So I think it's really important that um, we learn about politics and um, set the stage for a great country now so that when we are running it in a few decades, it'll be even better. Even though each of this year's candidates are different and disagree on a lot of issues, there is one thing they agree on. They can't win without support from millennials and minorities. Well, one thing about millennials, about young people over the years, has been that they vote at much lower rates than older voters. Uh, this is particularly true in the midterm elections when there's not a presidential race going on. So I think if young people want to have a voice in the 2016 presidential contest and the other ones on, on the ballot, they just have to go to the polls and, and turn out. Now, I think many of them are turned off by the kind of campaign that has been run. They are not as attracted, at least a lot of them, to Clinton as they were to Bernie Sanders. They clearly, at least from the polls, are not very much attracted to Donald Trump. Some, some are, obviously. But in terms of just sheer numbers, there are more of them that are favorable towards Clinton by a, a long shot that are favorable towards Trump. But are they favorable enough to Clinton to want to go out and, and vote for her? That'll be one of the questions uh, as we go into November 8th. One of the resounding features of speeches made by visiting politicians and campaigners this year has been urging students to just get out and vote. During President Obama's visit on November 2nd, the audience heard what is becoming Obama's trademark quote for this election. Make no mistake, this is, this, this is not something you can take for granted. All the progress we've made goes out the window if we don't do our jobs in these next seven days. Our future depends on what you do these next seven days. And at the end of the campaign, I know there are all sorts of negative ads and there's noise and there's distractions, but I want you to tune all that up. I want you to focus on the choice that you face in this election. Don't boo, vote. Don't boo, vote. Booing doesn't help. Voting helps. 